but I will just briefly mention that he actually did PhD in our institute. And currently, he is a professor at the Faculty of Physics, Warsaw University. And today, he will tell us about Nobel Prize in Physics, which was given this year. Okay, thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. I'm not sure if it wasn't better if we turn off the slides, lights here. No, yeah. yes. yes. because then this this entrance to hell would be better visible. Okay, so so I would like to start by stressing that I think that this year's Nobel Prize in Physics is the most philosophical prize in physics of all. I would even maybe say that it was Nobel Prize for experimental philosophy. Okay. Okay, so this is the, the announcement. So the Nobel Prize, as you probably know, was given for experiments with entangled photons, establishing the violation of Bell inequalities and pioneering quantum information science. And it was given to these three people, Alain Asper, John Clauser, and Anton Zeilinger, all of them experimentalists. But as I mentioned, this prize is very philosophical. So let me start with more philosophical picture by reiterating what we understand by so-called classical picture of the world. So picture of the world according to classical physics. And we can start with the quote by Laplace. Give me the positions and velocities of all the particles in the universe and I will predict the future. So of course, this is a statement of determinism of classical physics, but there is something more in it that basically we assume implicitly in classical physics or even explicitly that first of all, there are objects. So these particles yes, in the universe, that there are objects and objects by definition are objective. Yes? They are something we would say independent of the observer. They are objects and they have the physical quantities which are well-defined. Okay? So I would say that these are these characteristic traits of what we understand by classical physics and uh, picture of the world according to classical physics. And in this picture measurements, uh, they just reveal pre-existing values of physical quantities. So this is, I would say this, this uh, okay. When you think about the universe as a clock or, or a billard or something in, in this mechanical terms in this classical picture. So as you know, when quantum mechanics was born, uh, some people were not happy with what, what it, uh, what it stated and how it interpreted the reality. And this famous paper by Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen tried to argue that what quantum mechanics describe with the wave function formalism is not really the complete description of the world. It's just some approximation, approximate description. And there is some deeper theory, which is kind of classical. In, in this from in these terms that I described before, and quantum mechanics is just some imperfect uh, description. That's why it's weird. So they they came up with this idea to consider two particles, and okay, they basically considered a state which we could we could uh, think of as being given by this kind of wave function uh, where. Uh, both positions and momenta are either anti-correlated or correlated. Yeah? So this the Dirac delta means that if one particle is to the left, the other is to the right, and that they have uh, okay, equal, equal momenta. It could be opposite way. I mean, this is just an approximation of, of this wave function. Formally, we should make them more like Gaussian functions, which are not this pathological Dirac deltas. Okay? But why we can have such a function? Because actually, uh, operator, which is a sum of positions, and operator, which is a sum, the difference of momenta, they commute. So we can simultaneously have a state which has a well defined sum of positions and difference of momenta, okay? because of this minus sign here, they commute. Okay, and if you now consider such a state, then immediately uh, you, can, you can say such things that, first of all, if you look just at a single particle, its position and momentum is completely indetermined, okay? It can be anything. But once you know the position of one particle, you know perfectly the position of the other. And once you know the momentum of one, you know perfectly the momentum of the other. So the argument by Einstein was 
that if these particles are okay <laughs> far apart, which means that I, I, I should more modify slightly this function because I should somehow be able to say, okay, this is particle here and here. So I should somehow restrict the, 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 the values of, of each of these variables. But as I say, this is just to, to, sim to simplify this uh, description. If I measure position of one particle or momentum, I can determine with certainty the position momentum of the other. And if they are distant, that means that my measurement here should not influence any properties of the particle there, which means that since I can choose whether I can measure position momentum and it reveals the value of position momentum there, this value should already, should had been there before, before I measured, okay? Well, somebody had prepared the system. Exactly, so. Some, some time, right? Yes. And then send the other particle far away. Yes. So what's special? I mean, this, so, so the special thing is that by this argument, it implies that this particle far away should have a well-determined both position and momentum simultaneously, which contradicts the standard description of quantum mechanics, which doesn't allow us via Heisenberg uncertainty pr principle to have a particle with well-defined position and momentum simultaneously. So that was the point. So the argument was that since we can do it, Okay, that means that quantum description is imperfect because we have some elements of reality that exist, but quantum mechanics somehow just describes this smeared, gives us this smeared description, okay, which is kind of maybe approximate description. So to be more precise, in their paper, they defined what they mean by reality, okay, and by reality, by real. Uh, of real uh, features, they, they, they define things that uh, if without in any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity. So this argument means that we can predict position or momentum, whatever we choose, without disturbing the system because it's far away. And since we can predict it without disturbing, this element of reality should exist. So both for position and moment. Okay. So maybe uh, the, uh, it's better to change the sign. So, so, so like x one. Maybe. So plus <laughs> L, at the moment, L, L distance, yes. T is equal to minus T. So yes, okay, so. yes, I think you are right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Question about this way it's predicting. Isn't this already? Isn't this once you make a measurement of the first part, uh, particle, you actually also made the measurement of the second particle? No, it's not accepted. No, <laughs> separated by a large distance. So we assume that there is no superluminal influence in the universe. So whatever I do here should not influence the thing there. So if I can predict this feature, it had. Existed before I even decided to measure. Right, but doesn't mean if you then go to the other particle with subluminal light, make an uh, observation, then it will supposed to have the properties you predicted. Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. So how is it different? What? What? Well, how is it different predicting from observing? Because you have a certainty that you will measure this. Yes, but but it means that I can describe both momentum and position of the particle without disturbing it, whatever I choose here, this both things simultaneously. Okay, okay not simultaneously, because I have to choose which measurement I do, but this particle should be prepared for both options, yes, <laughs> in some sense. And this is incompatible with description of quantum mechanics. Yeah. Speaking, being located as a particle one, you will calculate the position and the momentum of the other particle. But the Heisenberg, yeah, exactly. Heisenberg principle doesn't tell you anything about the calculation. It tells oh, you about the measurements. And, and, yeah. and uh, the, the point is that you, you, you don't go to this other particle. Yeah. Yeah. No, okay, so uh, I, just I just reiterate argument of Einstein, yes? <laughs> so don't blame me for this. But, I, uh, but it's consistent with this definition, I mean. I'm just reading Bohr. Okay, so there was, of course, the reply by Bohr. Perhaps uh, agree that uh, if the particle is in the eigenstate of position state, 
then it shouldn't be simultaneously in the eigenstate state of momentum. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's the point. Yeah. And here it seems that it could be. Yes. Right? That, that there is some deeper theory in which it is possible, and quantum mechanics just give us this approximate, statistically average description where it's not possible. This is the argument by Einstein. So, strictly speaking, for what follows from this follows that either quantum mechanical description of reality given by the wave function is not complete. Okay, so this is what Einstein would like to, to uh, conclude. And this is the, then the, the, what Bohm was, was carrying out in his research, basically developing the so called hidden variable theories. Okay? Said something about hidden variables. Yes, yes, there was no. But that, that, that he believed that there is a theory with the mm -hmm. variable, but yes. it was not mentioned that there is a hidden variable theory or something. Like or we just admit that when operators representing two physical quantities do not commute, then these two quantities cannot have simultaneous reality. Yes. So this is our, uh, let's say, orthodox quantum interpretation. Okay? But we have to choose between these two. There is no 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 other no other way. Okay, so this is this discussion. So all quantum uncertainties can be understood via statistical distributions. So sorry, I mean these are not words of Einstein. These are just representing what I think Einstein would like to say. So. <laughs> yes, yes, via statistical distributions. Okay, of hidden variables corresponding to dispersion free state so this term dispersion free state was used by bell in, in in his paper so dispersion free state means like all physical quantities have well defined properties of everything of everything you can ask them <laughs> okay so then Bohr would reply that physical quantities are defined via measurement context and different measurement contexts may be incompatible and the, the observer is a key element of the theory. So you have to define this experimental context. This was basically the, the flavor of this reply by Bohr to, to this EPR argument. Okay, then comes von Neumann. And he basically gave the proof that hidden variables are impossible. And the proof was wrong. <laughs> Simply he assumed too much. He, he assumed something which he thought is natural, but it basically uh, he took the properties of quantum mechanical description in his proof. So he, he didn't consider general hidden variable theories, but theories which basically took too much from quantum theory. Tautology. You know, maybe not tautology, but he assumed something too strong. He considered the sum of two non-commuting phenomena to be the observation. Yeah, the, the, the eigenvalue should also sum. <laughs> basically, something like this. And and for couple yeah and for a couple of years it was regarded as a as a real proof, but of course then we have a hidden variable theory formulated by Bohm, so it is possible to to, to formulate hidden variable theory which gives the same predictions as quantum mechanics, and in fact this is a paper where uh, this is a review paper very short one by Bell where he explains why this von Neumann argument is wrong. I think it was written one year after this main paper with Bell inequalities, and I think Bell was asked to to write it. Yes, yes because no, sorry, it was written earlier, but the story is very complicated because he handed it to to, to the editors of the New Modern Physics. They wanted some some some, some corrections, so he, he sent this, this correction, but it was misfired. <laughs> after one year, they ah, okay. What happened to the paper? And he realized that it would, that it would never get to the, the Because in the end, he mentioned his main paper that, okay, apparently there is. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, so you can see that this is very philosophical discussion, and one could say that it could go on forever, like many philosophical discussions without any conclusions. And then, amazingly, in this paper, this is this main paper by Bell, yes, from, from 64. Uh, Bell showed that actually, if you if you want to predict quantum correlations with local hidden variable theory, it's not possible. And I will not present Bell uh, Bell statement because it's more qualitative, not so quantitative uh, way to prove that it's impossible. And this is the the paper which is like making things 
as simple as possible as and as quantitative as possible so that's why okay one of the co-authors uh, one of the Nobel Prize winners is there already so this is famous CHSH Bell inequalities so okay I would just briefly mention them here because they are the main I mean hero of our of our story even though maybe many people have seen them before but the assumption is that we imagine that there is some hidden variable hidden parameter that determines the correlation between the two particles and we consider the measurement device which has two buttons we can choose either we measure a1 or a2 physical quantity yes of this particle and this box will just give us plus minus one outcomes okay uh, and apart from this we don't assume anything about this box just what we can press these two buttons and there is the same box on the bob side with two uh, buttons. So the choice of the button is the choice of the question. Yes? We ask to this particle uh, about some physical quantity, we want to reveal the value of it. And if we assume reality, that means that this parameter lambda determines all physical quantities. So determines whether if we press A1 or A2, the, the value of this physical quantity is plus or minus one that it's already pre-existing. So in some sense that there is some function of lambda and the choice of measurement here. And I intentionally put choice of measurement here as well, just to remove it in a second by assumption of locality. Okay, but for a moment, let's keep it that, imagine that the value of this outcome may depend also on what Bob is choosing to measure, which is very strange. Okay, uh, and the same for the, for the Bob. So, is it a construction of a machine which cannot depend on? Yeah, yeah. Okay, but we could. Okay, but we could think that. Okay, because we can think that there are some invisible, you know, wires coming from B to A that changes. But the wire is a construction of a machine. Yes. If it's a local apparatus, yeah. then it cannot depend on that. Yeah. So, yes. so, so this is, yes. So, so exactly. So why are you going to use the reader? Because I want to distinguish these two assumptions of reality and locality, because there are two assumptions here and hidden. And now you, you have what you want, yes? You should now uh, be happy with this. I am objective to the word reality. Reality means that it's fixed, that this value of this quantity is well defined just by knowing lambda. That, that the values of measurements are real. Yes, are real. They exist independently of whether somebody measures them or not. They are somehow prepared for any possible questions you can ask with well definite values. Reality comes from the they are real, they are not created somehow at the moment of measurement. Yes, measurement just reveals them. This is this. You know, you just look into the into your, into your pot. What is there, and it's there. Okay, and the same for for Bob. But it's important to to distinguish these two things. And now, and now you can construct certain object which takes the results from Alice and Bob, multiplies them. And consider this kind of combination of measurement results depending on of which measurements were chosen by Alice and Bob. Who constructs C? Uh, C is constructed by somebody who obtained results from both. Must have already a knowledge yeah. about the A and B. Yeah, yeah. So, so A and B. How, how that is possible? Is it yes. cannot be A or B first. Of course. That's why they cannot. There is a gun. No, no, no. no, there is a third guy, or they send the results to each other. Say A and B, they are, uh, they agree that they will, every second they will measure something, okay? Mm -hmm. Whatever they want, A1 or A2 and B1 and B2, okay? And then after one year, they will connect this, 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 this uh, result. Then and check what is this value C, yes. 
Very yes. Yes. So now we have the C, and you can see that we can re rewrite it in this way. And now it's clear that since these values are just plus minus one, if B1 is equal B2, this is two or minus two, and this is zero. So this whole thing can be at most two or minus two. Okay, so basically the modulus of C is two for fixed plus minus one. There is no other option, it's plus or minus two. So that means that now if you average this C over some distribution of lambdas, because we can think that these hidden variables are distributed with some statistical some probability distribution, which mimics these correlations we observe. Okay, so we average this. But but lambda is the parameter that determines these values. But, but we can. The abstraction of a C depends on the fact that the lambda is shorter than the physical. Distance. Lambda describes the yes. It's prep, this this probability distribution describes the way these particles are prepared. So these particles are prepared with some lambda with some probability by by some god okay god he is sitting here yes and and they are prepared with some statistical distribution that's why we observe some correlations in our measurement outcomes and these correlations we observe by looking at this quantity and by this construction we know that this object here is plus or minus two for fixed lambda. So we, if we average it with some probability distribution, it can be at most between minus two and plus two. So the absolute value of expectation value of C is smaller than two, yeah. smaller or equal than two. And this is famous CHSH Bell inequality. Okay. Derived in this in this paper. Okay, so. It wouldn't be interesting if quantum mechanics didn't violate it. Okay? So we have an example of experiment where we can violate this inequality. So we can consider this kind of singlet state. So we have a spin one half and plus minus represents the projection plus one half minus one half on Z axis. So we have plus minus 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 plus. And we, this measurement simply correspond, different measurements correspond to choosing different axis of projection of our spin, different directions, okay? A1 and A2. Okay, we, I, okay. In, in experiments, we do it with polarizations, but to describe it, I think with spins may be more intuitive because we think about this direction of spin in space and we just say, okay, we measure in this direction, this direction. And then we have this spin observable, which simply is a Pauli matrix in direction N, yes? Yeah? So like this where n is a unit vector. So this is observable, which give us plus one if we have positive projection of spin in direction n and minus one if you have negative, so minus one half. Okay, so the values are plus minus one, not plus minus one half, but because for Bell inequalities, we want plus minus one. So we just rescale this spin measurement. And then if you compute expectation value of two, uh, of tensor product of two observables. So this means that observer A measures a spin projection in the direction A. So A is now just a vector in space. And the observer B measures a spin projection in direction B. And they record the results plus minus one. And then they just compute the product of this result because this is actually what this expectation value uh, tells us. The result is minus scalar product of A and B which represents the fact that this spin outcomes will be uncorrelated, I'm sorry, anti-correlated if they choose the same direction. So if B is equal to A, they measure in the same direction and then there is minus one. So it means they always get opposite projections, yes? If they measure in some other, then okay, then this is the expectation value. Okay? So there are very strong anti-correlations in this state very strong. And now by computing it for particular measurement choices, so we need to now choose A1, A2, B1, B2. So the directions of the spin measurements. And actually you can prove that, uh, okay, so we have this quantity, which is just this 
force color products that enter here. Okay? And now the optimal choice of measurements is just measuring one uh, spin either in X direction or Y direction, or okay, Z, sorry, X or Z direction, and the other in some 45 degrees rotated uh, directions. And now you see A1 and B1 is what? Is cosine of 45 degrees. So square root of two divided by two minus A1 and B2 is the same, square root of two divided by two. A2, B1 is also square root of two divided by two. And A2, B2 is minus square root of two divided by two, but it has different sign. So in the end, we get all, everything adds up constructively and we have this minus two square root of two. So of course, yes. So the modulus is bigger than two. Okay? And we have violation of Bell inequalities and you can say that it's very significant violation. Two square root of two compared with two. Okay, so now we have conclusion from this that no local realistic theory can reproduce such anti-correlations, such strong anti-correlations. <clears throat> okay, so now moving to experiments. The experiments are usually performed with photons and then we replace, replace the spin degrees of freedom and we think about polarization degrees of freedom of a photon. So spin up, spin down will be replaced by vertical horizontal polarizations. Uh, so we, we consider such a singlet and then we measure with polarizers, yes, which we rotate properly. Now you just have to be careful because the, the, the angles are divided by two because now the second basis, which was perpendicular for spin, now it's 45 degrees. And then Bob measures 22 half. And this is, this is the same, okay? And if photon goes through the polarizer, we assign plus one. If not, we assign minus one. Of course, in practice, we don't do it like this. We use the so-called polarizing beam splitters because it's not very clever to lose the photon that has wrong polarization. We would rather want to split them. So the polarizing beam splitter splits orthogonal polarizations to two directions and we can detect both events. It's better because then we will uh, detect uh, the photon irrespective of polarization and we will not be worried that we were losing photons beforehand and we just don't observe because they were lost. Okay? Uh, if we just focus on one polarization. So, so this is how, how it's, it's better done. Uh, but actually I think in Klaus experiment, it was like standard polarizer, I think. Uh, so so this, this first experiment by Clauser used uh, this two photon, cascade in calcium. I think this is, I don't know if it's visible, but I think this is this two photon cascade. And, uh, and through this two photon cascade, you basically end up with two photons, which are in this kind of superposition of different angular polarization, uh, the circular polarizations. So this is maybe a different state, but it's basically equivalent to, to the singlet. You just have to look at it differently. So, so they were produced here and then we had this uh, polarizers and this pm1 pm2 are these two detectors in the end and they uh, changed the measurements and observed this value and uh, this measurement these detectors were distant were, were separated by five meters and uh, even though they observed six sigma violation of bell inequalities in this experiment, one could argue that there were still many loopholes, okay? So what, what kind of loopholes we are talking about? So first of all, there is this locality loophole, which actually was, 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 was also in this experiment. So we, we, we should be, I mean, in order to convince Einstein or other hidden variable uh, funds, uh, we should convince them that when we are changing the measurements, first of all, that we do it randomly, that it is not known beforehand which measurement we will set, because if it was known beforehand, a hidden variable model could be constructed that simply uses this fact that knows what we will be measuring and gives us proper input that we measure what they want. The first, they 
So basically the choice should be made in a way that information about this choice cannot uh, reach the, okay, the, 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 the yes. And, uh, and, uh, and so, so we should really switch this, the, this measurements quickly and randomly and quicker than this information can, can reach the, 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 other, the, other, uh, the other side. So we are really, really, really sure that this other detector will not, the result of our detector will not depend on our setting. Okay. And then there is also the so-called detection loophole, which means that we need to really detect majority of these photons produced. Because if we lose too much, you can construct again a hidden variable theory in which photons somehow conspire that that, that the sample we observe is not representative sample. Mm -hmm. that, the, that the fact that photon is being detected or not is, is, is also determined by some hidden variable which, which just cheats us that we violate value inequalities. But we, we, we in fact have a hidden variable theory which has some you know, fun, funny uh, dependence on the detection event depending on how we set up our measurement. Okay. How does 60% hmm? align us to make sure that there's no fluctuation? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, okay, it's, I think it's, I mean, it's basically, it's basically, you know, this two, two square of two over two tells you that if you really want to be sure that they don't conspire enough and you are still above this two, you need to have this efficiency. Okay, that, that with, I don't know, with 90, percent efficiency maybe you can be sure that you violate up to two point something and with lower you will be only able to prove that you violate slightly and below this you will not be able really to prove that you violate indeed something okay so this was the first experiment and it had this two loopholes so then uh, was this a spare experiment from 19 okay there were a few experiments but i think this was this this last one so it was basically the same experiment but the difference here is again that now indeed there is this uh, two detectors for each polarization, not a single one, so it's uh, better. And the other thing is that he was indeed able now to switch this measurement quickly. He had some acoustic optical device here that simply changed the, some some uh, uh, some diffraction grating that directed light here or there, and it could be switched very quickly. Okay? But it was not random. <laughs> It was very quick, but predetermined. So, okay, so it was good, but not perfect. Uh, but it was switching every 10 nanoseconds. So it was enough for 12 meter distance that was in this experiment. Okay, so, it, so light could not travel 12 meter distance in 10 nanoseconds. I think it's correct. Uh, two accidents are important for the distance, okay, and then the the difference in emission of the two photons from the scale, which is something for nanoseconds. So okay, yes, <laughs> yes, that's true. So the violation was by 10 standard deviations, so, so a big improvement. And also these loopholes were, at least this locality loopholes were a bit closed, but the detection loophole was still there. Detection was very low, mainly because these calcium atoms are emitted everywhere. <laughs> not they are not directed in, in one beam, they are everywhere. So most of them are lost. And the second thing I think is because this is this optical opti op so uh, uh, phosphorus photonic switch is so that it is diffracted on some standing wave. Yes, exactly. Okay, so it depends. This wave oscillates with this 20 and yes. something like that. So it means that at one extreme it, 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 it is in this direction and at other extreme in this direction. Yes. There are also other directions. Yes, that's that. true. So this was progress, but not, not complete. And then actually this, this was this great year of 2015. Hmm? Yes, so, so it is quite recent achievement. And actually it was one year where three in the groups independently, we would agree that closed all the loopholes. Maybe some people- Somebody yeah. <laughs> some other. I know from our faculty, Adam Bednos was really looking at every detail of this experiment. <laughs> yes. Uh, and he argued that statistics was not yeah. enough and something yeah. like this. Yeah. But, but basically, this experiment was, I, I would say, the most different from all the others because it involved the concept of um, 
of uh, entanglement swapping in a sense, because the entanglement was first produced between photon and this NV center uh, state of electron in, in this, this nitro vacancy in diamond. And then these photons were, uh, were collected on a beam splitter and detected. And then entanglement was transferred to these NV centers and these NV centers were measured. And this was good because measuring this NV center is very efficient, unlike measurements of photons. So this, was, this allowed them to close the detection loophole. Okay, and also the distance here, I don't know if I showed, the distance was, I don't know, 800 meters between these two labs. Okay, so it was really significant. Then, then there was this Tylinger experiment, so the Nobel Prize winner, which was purely optical. Yes, there was no NV centers. The, the, the advantage here is then they used this efficient uh, parametric down conversion source of entangled photons, which have been used for many years. but here they also use novel detectors which were highly efficient detectors so they had i don't know 90 something percent detection efficiency that's why they were able to close the the detection loophole and very similar setup was done by NIST. Process, the direction of the yes yes exactly that, that's the advantage yes that we, we we have these beams okay and then uh, okay so it was uh, this 2015 in 2017 this was this experiment uh, via satellite where where this this bell violations were demonstrated on the distance of 1200 kilometers so this was like a record distance because they were sent from satellite but this was as you see one per per second it was very low rate but still they they were able to demonstrate the the violation of bell inequalities so uh, uh, practical implications so we have this philosophical part Oh, a lot. I don't remember now. No, 10, maybe 10 sigma. I don't know. I don't, I'm okay. Maybe Adam Bednar would agree, but no, but I think it was uh, much more than enough. Per, uh, I mean, it is closing these loopholes. Yes, this is the point. So, so, okay. So maybe, I don't know. So maybe I, I'm exaggerating. Maybe it was statistically not so better because we have we have uh, other uh, issues here that we want to close this loophole. This is our main goal. Yes. Okay, so, so one uh, practical implication is the so-called secure key distribution using entangled states. And this was this famous pro protocol proposed by Arthur Eckert, which is known to everybody probably here, which basically uses this fact that we have these correlations and we can measure different, uh, we can use different settings of polarizers and measure a measure polarization and they are they, they will be correlated and without going into details of this protocol because this protocol actually uses three bases on each side but okay it's it's just because it was proposed by Arthur Eck at that time like this but it's not necessary um, then they can obtain correlations or anti-correlation or whatever and the interesting thing is that somehow the security of this key that is distributed is exactly related with this fact that we, we cannot have a local hidden variable theory describing this correlation. Because if we had, somebody could prepare this correlated polariz polar polarized photons and keep this information about which polarization will be, the, will be sent to which party and what will be the polarization. And if they measured it, this person would also have this uh, information about this uh, polarization, okay? So uh, about the key. And the fact that this, <laughs> values of polarization they do not exist beforehand they are just somehow created after the measurement is the guarantee of the security that simply these values of these bits they are they are, they, they are not existing okay beforehand so nobody ha can have possession of it okay and and remik is i don't know if remik here remik <laughs> I'm in my office, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm listening. Ah, okay, you are here. Okay, so Remik is an expert in this kind of stuff. So you can push this idea of security to the extreme. And basically using this bell violations, you can even have a secure key generation using entangled pairs, even if you don't trust the source. And even if you don't trust the measurement devices. <laughs> You just are given measurement device with these two buttons, and this can be from Russia or any other country. 
and you are and you play with this and you see this violation of valid equalities and you are sure that there was entanglement there and you can from this you can extract a key which you are sure nobody shares okay because nobody could be correlated with your correlation because it would not allow violation of valid inequalities okay so sorry Remik, if i trivialized this and and then maybe i should mention because Actually, this is very, I would say, a hot field, this device independent quantum key distribution. And uh, this year there were at least three experiments we, which apparently for the first time, again, closed the loopholes for these conditions really to have this device independent quantum key distribution. So I don't know, Remik, if you agree that they closed the loopholes. I agree. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so so of course it's not maybe very efficient way to distribute the key because as you see this is like 95 sec secure bits for eight hours experiment but uh, but they have this advantage over other quantum key distribution protocols that here really we don't have to assume anything about physics of our devices okay unlike in other protocols where there are many hack attacks and you can hack this quantum key distribution systems if they are not you know perfectly implemented of, of if there are some imperfections okay so just to mention some other Zeilinger's achievements phased single photon state teleportation first entanglement swapping first bank transfer using quantum key teleportation of the photon under Danube and between two Canary Islands on the distance of 140 kilometers distributing a key between Austria and China but it was distributing assuming satellite is uh, <laughs> secure and okay many others <laughs> so among Nobel Prize winners I think that Seilinger has the most like achievements in terms of numbers but okay maybe because Clauser and Asper were the first ones really to to, to do this expert bell, bell, bell violations they, they deserve this special credit um, so of course Bell I mean if Bell was alive he would he would he would get the price i think yeah I... yes yeah, so one of them would drop <laughs> yes okay so so to 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 end i don't know to end the talk maybe i would just finally mention to stress once again these philosophical implications so basically uh, all discussions about interpretation of quantum mechanics amounts to this question what really does wave function represent so usually this is how i tell it to my students during quantum mechanics course that they should give yes no answers to this question so first of all is the wave function a complete description of an experimental situation and if no that means you are this hidden variable person yes okay if yes then we go further okay so now you have to uh, you have to answer is it an objective reality independent of an observer so is it like you know physical being like object yes w without any reference to observe and if you say no that means you follow the standard copenhagen approach of Bohr that you say that it's like description writing preparation of the system and measurement and and that's what it is okay it allows us to 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 predict our measurement outcomes but we should not assign this this fundamental objective reality to it if on the other hand you you want to say yes then again you have you have two options so do you think that the collapse of the wave function is real a physical process exactly so then you are Penrose <laughs> If it's if you say that it really should be explained, for example, by gravity, that gravity forces the wave function to collapse in some way, then you are this uh, guy who likes Penrose idea. And if you say no, what do you think is the last uh, the last option? For? So you believe in objectivity of the wave function, but you don't agree that collapse is a physical process 
Then you have this many word interpretation. So you, you, you allow that all of them exist, yes? That all these variants of the superpositions exist, but the wave function is an objective thing, but we are just parts of it in all possible superpositions and so on, okay? So now you have only bad choices. <laughs> I think there are no good choices, I think, here. So violation of Bell inequalities excludes at least this, this thing, okay, with this assumption of locality, because you can still have non-local hidden variable theories, of course. Okay, so with this confusion, you may ask some clever people what they think. So, so the conception of objective reality has thus evaporated into the transparent clarity of mathematics that represents no longer the behavior of particles, but rather our knowledge of this behavior. What we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. So this is Werner Heisenberg. Quantum state is not an objective property of an individual system, but information obtained from its preparation, which may be used to predict future measurement results. Collapse of the wave function happens in the observer's mind, not because there is some special physical process occurring there, but rather because the state itself is a conceptual construct of the observer. And then Anton Seilinger to end. When physicists perform experiments in their laboratories, they are realists. They speak about photons and electrons moving here and there. The moment you start a philosophical discussion, however, and ask them about foundations of quantum mechanics, most of them will admit that in fact nothing exists unless there is a measurement context which defines it. <laughs> okay, and I would like to finish with, uh, maybe some of you already know, because I, I like this quote very much. So this is uh, Witkatz's comment on quantum mechanics taken from this, from this essay, philosophical essay, uh, which is, okay, translated to English, it will be, about uh, phenomena of real object and physical and its part in uh, and its part and about observer in equations of physics so for for people who are not polish vikati was our famous artist philosopher uh, and intellectual between the first and he, he was most active between first and second world war and uh, but as you see he was also interested in science a lot and he was very up to date with everything. So this is a Polish thing. And I, because the, the, there are people who are not speaking Polish, I, I didn't, I was not brave enough to translate it myself. So I put it to this deep L algorithm and it translated it like this. Even more, more stark, starkly, there is the observer's problem in microphysics in connection with the explicit requirement to consider only what is observable. The observer not only slipped in here, he simply sat back in the relevant equations as in armchairs. The observer must be accepted as an external necessary element of the physical view, which thus loses its absolute pseudo objectivity, objective character. The enemy of pure physicalism, the defeat of which was once an illusory triumph of materialism is already inside the fortress. <laughs> Okay, so with this, I will finish. Thank you. And just a simple remark. Uh, Clauser uh, did his experiment when he was just a very young graduate student. And according to his uh, description, he was actually violating advice of his advisor. Uh, but he was so happy with the result that he decided to quit active research in physics and started the company, which as far as I know, still exists and is very yes. successful. There are more questions or comments? Uh, yes, so I, we saw that you presented this, uh, <coughs> let's say, proof for this proof of this inequality, assuming this uh, locality, but there are more assumptions in those theorems. So. No, the other assumptions is this randomness. So sometimes people phrase it like free will assumption also, because to really exclude local hidden variable, you have to exclude somehow also the so-called super determinism. So of course, everything, uh, you cannot exclude that we are in some computer program, which was pre-programmed from the very beginning, and all the our measurement settings and results are just pre-programmed events. Okay, this is so-called super determinism, and we can never exclude this option. <laughs>
So violation of Bell inequality requires assumption about real randomness or free will that we can really switch. And this was not determined by something before. Yeah. And that, but that's, I think, all assumptions apart from these two. Yes, so obviously you cannot never somehow uh, dismiss this uh, free will objection because completely deterministic way. Mm -hmm. It's imaginary, there's no contradiction in that. It's only very complex. Yeah. The, the problem is it's very complex. <laughs> so, so there were, so Anton Seidinger actually performed for the first time the experiment, which was like aspect experiment, but not with periodic the switching. Mm -hmm. but they simply, at that time, they were, I think it was, I don't know, uh, at the start of the century. Uh, the, there were better switches and there were such uh, electro uh, acoustic switches. Switches and then they were fed with random numbers. Quantum random numbers, uh, actually. Not, not yet. Uh, then, in this 2015. But, uh, ah, ah, you say before. But they also performed, I think, in 19, this experiment with photons coming from quasars. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the correlation. So, so as I, as I, as, as you also said, so the, the, the main idea of this theory is that this. Setting of this of this uh, measurement does not depend on lambda. So mm -hmm. lambda yes. does not depend yes. on the setting. So because this randomness was achieved by 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 producing random numbers from the, from the quasars, so uh, so the possible correlations between the lambda and achievements were uh, sent back to seven billion years because this was the mm -hmm. the the. the Youngest of this photon, okay. But if you really insist that it is uh, when when the past uh, columns of these two photons from very distant quasars overlap, so I think it is pushed back to something like nearly thirteen billion of years. So, so, so if if the, the everything is determined, it must have been determined at the very beginning. Yes. Okay. yes. So this is, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes right. go on. Hey, Rafa, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Yes. Hello. Thanks for your talk. Could you go back one slide or two slides concerning your uh, question three? Oh, yes. But I cannot switch now. Okay. Now I can. Le yes. Yes. Here, here, here. Yes. So using the theory of elections, you can say yes, no, or abstain. In the first question, is the wave function a complete description of an experimental situation? There is also a third option I would advocate. Simply, we do not know. Because we can hope it is, but maybe we don't know. Maybe it's, yes. theory is not good enough. But if you need to give an answer, then what? <laughs> Almost yes. <laughs> Perhaps yes. We should also agree that, that Einstein was right that the description by by wave function is not complete because it does not predict individual results. Yeah. Yes, of course, in this sense. <laughs> and so, you uh, never know whether perhaps a more general theory will emerge who would perhaps describe the situation even better. And this is a real question whether we can have something better. Yes. Then, then, then we can have, but yes. it must be probabilistic. Yes. yes. So, okay. of course, this is a okay, simplification of this question. I don't claim that what we know is the fundamental ultimate theory. Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. we can have deeper theory, but still not this one. Yes. Not, not the one with this dispersion free uh, states. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, in a sense, Bohr won this debate in the sense that he impose on us this interpretation which we have now okay so this this because this is it was not con contextuality at that time but this was this idea of or this was exactly this what we now call context contextuality mm -hmm. i think i remember the quote of one famous physicist of many years ago i don't remember which one uh, which amount to another Answer this question, namely, who cares? <laughs> I just have a short comment. When I first learned 
about the single electroweight function of two electrons and its properties, it seemed to me to be one of the most natural things I could imagine. So I have a difficulty in appreciating the drama of this <laughs> situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have multi-particle wave function. It's not just uh, something which is contracted on a single particle wave function. And it has some properties which are extremely natural from the point of view of mathematics in which you described it, right? And the single wave function is fantastic example. But this is something which we know now because at the moment when Schrodinger wrote the paper about this oh, assignment, yeah. It was for everybody. It was it was nearly very clear that what does it mean that there is a state of a component system? There's some state of this system. And some state of this system. It's okay. And they somehow combine to the state of the composite system. And the, well, well, actually, the one thing in quantum mechanics, in mathematics of quantum mechanics, is something which is very simple: linear theory. And, and this linearity is to be blamed for all that because it says that. If you have this state and this state, you can, these are legit, two legitimate states. So, the linear combination is also a legitimate state. This is something which is really a simple assumption. And this is what you said, actually. From a mathematical point of view, this is a counterpart of your physical statement that this is obvious. But classically, it's not so. That's right. That's right. Very good. Okay. I I don't so see maybe any more. So maybe we need the non-linear quantum mechanics. 